Hello and welcome. My name is Ben Dark and I am a gardener and this is my podcast. It is about plants and the people who plant them. Welcome to the week in gardening, a week that started with a thaw. The snow that had been lying on the ground from the end of the week before and the weekend was bombarded with rain. Rain that said enough of this, snow is old news, it is yesterday's precipitation, we are the future. And it came down strong and heavy, and all of the little patches of snow, the crescents that lurked in the areas away from the sunshine, got saturated with the water like they were some cocktail base, one of those slushy cocktails that you pour maybe a mojito into. And the snow did its best. It hung around for a little bit, but then it succumbed to the melt. And that meant we got a double dose of water. We got a lot of morning water, and then we got that stored water, that potential water that had been hanging around for the whole weekend, which gave everything the, the quality of a quagmire. Really not a very good day for doing any heavy soil work or planting. But unfortunately, that is what... I needed to do on Monday. There were some plants that needed to go in. A very big, mature, climbing hydrangea. You pay a lot of money for mature climbing hydrangeas. I know that they do romp away once they get themselves established. But in those first few years, they do have a tendency to, to lurk around and not grow fast. And I wanted one that was going to look quite gnarled and ancient and venerable and wise, really instantly so i had to splash out on one in a 50 liter pot at that several hundred pounds but i think it looks good we planted that from a path against a a north facing out building wall and then moved on to some more serious planting this was planting a very large magnolia grandiflora that is the evergreen magnolia the magnolia with the two-tone leaves that are shiny on top and are a sort of matte, browny colour underneath. And the whole thing that you see, you see undersides and oversides ruffled together on a magnolia, so it has a, quite an interesting foliage effect. And we were planting a standard, which is essentially this 150 litre pot, which is very big, and then a trunk, and then a little pyramid of leaves, like the shape of a Christmas tree, but 20 foot up in the air. Planting it in such wet meant that the preparation had a sort of civil engineering quality about it, like we were about to embark on the construction of the foundations for some sort of bridge. Normally, digging a hole for a plant requires a spade and somewhere to put spoil and some things to put in the hole that are not plant. So things that the plant will like to have in there, like food and fungi and anything anything else that you uh, you fancy chucking down the hole but this time we had to prepare by putting boards around everywhere that we were going to transport the tree over so boarding the lawn and boarding areas of the flower bed that we were going to take the tree over which meant digging out herbaceous plants and moving them elsewhere all of this to avoid compaction and smear and general destruction the catastrophic effects of playing with wet soil mud pies are not appreciated by plants we want to keep the the structure nice and light so all of this was messy work there's nothing that gets a gardener more messy than carrying around muddy boards i find because you want to be big and strong and manly and carry a whole sheet by yourself and that requires you to pick up the sheet, one hand on the top and one hand on the bottom, and press your entire body against it as if it were a sheet of metal and you a magnet. And if the plywood is already very, very muddy, then you get a full body mud smear. Anyway, we boarded out the, the lawn and started moving this tree around. And the wonderful thing about standard trees is that they are essentially a big, long lever. The trunk is leverage for the weight of the soil and the roots. So we 
got this onto a, onto a sack barrow and moved it all across and then we rolled it into its position. So you take it out of the pot and you get the root ball which is held together with with wire and just gently and carefully rolled it over the boards and plopped it into its pre-dug hole, filled it up with all of the good stuff that goes into the hole and let it stand up, let it stand triumphant like like raising a flagpole like that wonderful propaganda shot of those GIs raising raising the flag on the mountain top and we did this with the magnolia and then then it falls into its hole and suddenly goes and, and suddenly momentum takes over and it flips itself upright and you have a tree in position where no tree was before which is which is a satisfying thing it's nice when you have that kind of help the worst kind of plants to plant the ones that have given me the most trouble in the world are plants with a similar sized root ball plants with the the 150 liter or so root ball that have no strong trunk they have a shrubby top growth and worst of all a shrubby top growth that is that is wider than the root ball because then you can't turn it on its side and roll it along the root ball. I remember working in this garden, this oligarch's garden up in North London, and we had to plant about 15, maybe 18 vast yew mounds. They called them domes, but I think a dome is probably more geometric. I'd call them mounds. And they were almost the shape of a of a yo-yo, if you can picture that two hemispheres, one the root ball, one the leaf, and in the middle a tiny little bit of, of trunk. And getting them into position was an absolute nightmare. I seem to remember that being one of the wettest winters I can ever remember as well. In the end, I think we had to rope them behind a tractor, like they were water skiing, and the tractor was their speedboat, and then swing them out a little bit away from the path the, the tractor had taken into the holes where they would slide down some scaffolding poles and, and land in this soup, soup of water that had accumulated over months of torrential rain. It must have been the winter 2010 into 11. What a very wet year. Anyway, hopefully this winter will not will not go that way, though this week it did seem to. Tuesday was a little bit wet as well. I dug another hole. And as the tree had started its new life, so another life came to an end. I found a little muntjac deer that had expired in the orchard. I don't know how terrible its last hours might have been, but it chose a nice place to go. And I went and dug a grave for that in the woods, which is actually a very hard task. Muntjac deers aren't big. They're about the size of a normal-sized dog. And I decided to give it a nice deep grave so no one's going to go and disturb it and, and dig it up. But it was hard work. I really respect people who could bury a body, a human body, at that depth with just a shovel and with just one night without waking everyone up by swearing and cursing about it. So, so I did that. They have, they have very long, almost thangs. Muntjac deer, which I didn't realise. It's it's quite interesting to see. I don't know what they're used for, but I'm guessing it's used for getting under the the skin of, of trees, under the bark, and getting strips of it off. Because I certainly don't think that it's used for for tearing carrion from from the bodies of their prey. So that was that was very interesting. I was thinking about just dragging it into the woods and leaving it for for foxes and kites and beetles and whatever else to, to break down. But then I thought no doubt it would be found in a game of hide-and-seek. Someone would stumble into it. And uh, So anyway, it got buried. To recover from all that excitement, I did some penance. I did some weeding gravel paths, which is actually quite a jolly job because you really do see where you've been. You can can see all the little tufts that you've pulled out and popped away and the pristine gravel surface. My feet were very wet by this point, and that's quite miserable for a gardener, for anyone, I think, but I feel more sympathy for, for gardeners. And so I desperately looked for solutions to try and warm them up. I tried to burn them 
with the blowtorch, the weeding blowtorch, this little flamethrower that you can use for, for scorching off weeds. It doesn't work particularly well for that, but it does work for, for taking a little bit off the, of the wet edge off your boots. That's a health and safety tip for any of you pro gardeners. Don't tell your boss, just go out there and, and try warming up your toes with the blowtorch. Anyway, Tuesday petered out with cold toes and, and a stooped back, and we all went home to try again on Wednesday. And Wednesday started with rain, and it didn't really look like it was going to start at all. It didn't look like the sun was going to bother coming out. It looked like the night was going to extend its shift and just wetly lay on top of us, like, like a flood inundating an East Anglian village. But no, in the end it did get light, and the light showed us more rain. And through this rain, a few brave gardeners struggled, cleaning up, dismantling sheds and rackety old outbuildings, doing cleaning tasks, hanging things up, doing the work that can't really be called gardening, but can be called wet weather fiddling. We also had ideas. We stopped and pointed at things and drew little pictures in the air of what flower beds might one day look like, which was, which was quite jolly. It's a very useful skill to have to be able to describe your vision concisely and clearly so that others can, can understand it. I think it should be part of, part of the general horticultural syllabus. It definitely helps you make money as well. If you can get people to, to sign up with your, with your enthusiasm and your, your hypothetical master plan. It would be a sort of debating club for horticultural students. You could have it where you had the most ugly plans possible, completely disproportioned, all of them terminating with 15 foot high concrete walls. And anyone who could persuade the client to go along with this would get given an A. And anyone whose client said, but can't we just have some roses and leave the concrete out of it, would get a D. There we go. Take note. Even in the rain, there were lots of irises out, which was nice. Because the iris, the, a lot of the, the winter bulbs are incredibly reactive to the sun. And I know a lot of plants in, in, in midsummer are as well, but, but particularly at this time of year, they hide themselves away if they know that the pollinators aren't going to be about. The snowdrops become drops, not snow parachutes, as they are when the sun's out. And the crocuses become coloured stalks, more than wonderful cups of eggy light. But irises, because their unfurling seems to be so unbelievably complicated, they, they stay out in the rain no matter what. Lots of the, the little irises that I put in last year, the reticulata irises, the, the harmony and so on, have come back looking even better, even better and brighter. You don't need many of them to, to make an impression because they are such a blue blue. And they're so weirdly unexpected at this time of year. We're used to, we're used to snowdrops, but, but irises somehow seem odd. They seem like something bird of paradise like. Something from a, a Hawaiian shirt has somehow turned up on a patch of wet soil in southern England in February. Which is nice. We like shocking incongruities, us gardeners. Talking of shocking incongruities, on Thursday I went off to university for my little course and I had cleaned myself. There was less mud. So I went in to learn all about American gardens. American gardens of the 18th century. So that is Thomas Jefferson and Ilk. A very eccentric man, a very eccentric gardener, Thomas Jefferson. I recommend that readers find a picture of his magnificent vegetable terrace. It is most singular and most incredibly attractive. I will try and put a photo of it up on the Facebook group at some point. Anyway, that was Thursday. Back to work on Friday. And while I was away from nature, while I was sitting under the lights and at a desk, 
the weather decided to change, and it was equally emphatic, but it decided to be emphatically windy instead of rainy. And it was one of those days of gusts and gale that blows branches down from trees and even blows flat bamboo and knocks everything about the place and chucks pigeons up in the air. Pigeons are the only birds that seem to fly in there and they do that amazing thing. You'll recognise it where they they want to go into a tree and the wind is going so fast that they go right past the tree and then almost do this hovering air brake job and then hook back to it and sort of manage to land and you see them skidding all across the sky going sideways when they're trying to fly forwards it's very very amusing it's also the kind of weather that that brings branches down on people's heads so try to stay away from the trees it's a nice thing about working in a private garden you just need to tell people just don't go out under the trees because the trees might might decide that they want to join you down there. When I worked in, in Chiswick House, which is obviously a garden with an immense history, one of the great gardens of the, the English landscaping movement, but that means that it has lots of mature trees that are entering their sort of leprous dotage and I want to shed limbs about the place. And every night before a storm was spent checking wind speed gusts to see if they'd reached this, this health and safety threshold where the park would have to be closed in fear of squashed dog walkers. It's nice not to have that, that concern so you can really enjoy a blustery day for what it is, a good bit of natural theatre. I worked on some plans and projects and plant purchasing, and my colleague went into the greenhouse and potted on some of the cuttings that we've got knocking around in there. There's lots of things that we took in the autumn. Because we've got a heated propagating bench now, you can work wonders with, with things that shouldn't really take cut, autumn cuttings of dahlias. When you'd normally take them in spring, they've they've taken well, and lots of schizophragma, that climbing hydrangea relative, those are sending out roots, and other other bits and pieces, bits of lavender clippings, and and the fun stuff that isn't really going to going to save the garden because when we plant, we tend to plant on much bigger scales than we're propagating in, but it but is is the lifeblood of the of the industry of the the fun bits of the gardening so we make sure that we are propagating and propagating well even if when we carry out new projects it generally calls for for a purchase of plants but things like things like having having an extra 20 little lavenders that we've grown ourselves it's not going to hurt and there might be there might be occasion for them having having extra extra high value plants like like the climbing stuff like the schizophragmas again it's wonderful it means that if we see an ugly larch there we can send something shooting up it and it keeps us connected with the the legions of brilliant gardeners who have gone before us before mail order catalogues and and online credit card purchases, who would work away at their their treasures, building up their collections. I'm also propagating from this pelagonium, which I'm pretty convinced is just a very very standard normal pelagonium that you could probably buy anywhere, but belonged to to someone's father who was a keen pelagonium grower has since passed away and this was the last surviving of his collections and it had grown wonderfully long it almost a pelagonium snake of a of a stem as it been kept inside somewhere with this little tuft of leaves at the end and i've been teasing that and and um taking bits off it and now i think there's about seven or eight of these of these inherited pelagonium plants that we can give back in the spring to be grown on in in memory of the man which is which is nice it's good to have the opportunity to to do these things i did something very similar once for for a lady who'd lived in the same house for over 70 years much of that 70 years with with the same man who'd since passed away and he had planted lots of apple trees but they were all coming to the the end of their life i don't know what happened to them because you expect them to live longer but we managed to get a get a cutting from one of those and get it to take and, and replant it where he would have wanted to see it gosh there's a lot more a lot more death in this episode 
of the garden log, the normal episodes. But that's that's what we get in in midwinter. We've got lots of time to talk about about birth and life in the spring episodes, which are just around the corner. Anyway, enough of that. Let's see if I have any recommendations this week. My first recommendation this week is for a blog and a particular post on this particular blog. The blog is The Oxonian Gardener, which can be found at oxoniangardener.co.uk, which is a blog that I've been reading for some time and always enjoy. It's erudite and thoughtful and takes a different approach often to, to various subjects. And this is no different, this week's post. It is about a visit to a place that I hadn't heard of called Astle Manor. That's A-S-T-H-A-L-L, Manor. And it focuses on the incredible rose pruning technique they have there. At this place, they, they seem to ignore all of the normal advice about taking out crossing stems or stems that might rub against each other and embrace that tangled, thickety nature. Well, a cultivated thicket, they twist the roses down and amongst itself, so it forms these these wonderful circular shapes, these intricate decorative coils. It looks almost like those old wicker carpet beaters. Anyway, all of this done on the walls of the house looks absolutely fantastic. It's the kind of thing that that might happen. When I was talking about rose pruning last week and I was talking about doing little fleur-de-lis, well, if, if my fleur-de-lis vision had been taken and amplified and drugged amphetamined and let loose on some sort of fantasy castle, then it might end up looking like this. So I really recommend you go and see that. And there's a little video on the page as well, so you can see the head gardener at work on these roses. So once more, that's theoxoniangardener.co.uk. All the photos on there are the roses in their bare winter form, which is, I suppose, when this technique probably looks at its most wonderful and magnificent. I think that in summer, well, the Oxonian Gardener describes it as cloud pruning, and I think in the summer it probably would look cloud-like. It would be a mass of leaves and the eye wouldn't be able to discern this wonderful thing. They would just see a, a dense mass of roses and flowers and leaves, which would be equally, equally magnificent, I'm sure. My other recommendation is at the complete opposite end of the gardening spectrum, a garden almost without flowers, much to the disappointment of my wife and my friend who accompanied me to this garden. We went down to Paynes Hill, which is one of the very, very important gardens in the story of, of the English landscape movement. It's a circuit garden, one of those gardens where you wander around and are surprised at every corner by a gothic folly, or a crystal grotto, or a Turkish tent upon a hill. And it has a magic of its own. I felt it very strongly, and I don't know if that's because I've spent quite a lot of time looking into, into this movement and where it developed, or because it has just a weird charm to it. In its modern form, it has the A3 almost crashing over the Gothic Tower, and then a strange fence and a burnt-out car on the other side. So you get this sort of poignant reminder of, of how the Great Garden has fallen and what it must have been like, and also a sense of the, the playfulness of the the people who built it. They were building themselves a theme park, essentially, somewhere to just impress people and make them giggle. And it's occasionally nice to, to go back and remind ourselves that our forebears were not wonderfully serious people, that like Jefferson, they, they built vegetable terraces and strange ruins for no reason on the shores of a lake. There is there is a human urge. I suppose it's the same urge that makes you cover your 
your walls in incredibly impractical and labour-intensive rose bumps and baubles. It's just that urge to, to absurdity, to see what will happen if we do build this here. So if you want to go and see something utterly absurd, then go there. There are, there are some snowdrops and other bits and pieces if, if garden architecture is not your thing. I'll put a picture of my, my visit there up on the Facebook page, The Garden Log podcast group as well thank you very much for listening to today's episode as always you can contact me at the garden log podcast at gmail.com or at ben's garden on twitter or garden the dark on instagram i do enjoy hearing from you so so let me know what you've been up to say hello ask for some advice i've been giving advice this week on plants but also on podcasting techniques so there might be some more horticultural podcasts coming your way soon i will uh, do a new podcast roundup at some point in the in the future on the recommendation section because there's a couple of new ones out there that i think are probably worth listening to that's it from me for now i hope that you all have a wonderful week out there whether you are in the garden or not and we shall see what the weather decides to do. Because it's being so decisive, I expect something, something equally forthright. I expect a week of complete dense sea fog or sunshine. Sunshine could be pleasant as well. We'll see. Until next time, thank you very much and goodbye. Mm-hmm.